So we were talking about guidance. The Islamic understanding of repentance is uh, in terms of going back onto the path. And the Quran does encourage people that if people go away from their bad path back to the right path, Allah will be compassionate. Um, I mentioned that Islam promises success to those who are rightly guided. The Quran has a lot to say about winners and losers and success and failure. Um, those who stand on guidance from their Lord, the Quran says, these are the ones who are successful. And um, the party of Allah are the ones who will be successful. But those who are led astray are the losers. There's a lot of discussion about losers in the Quran. So there's a divided world between winners and losers. Um, these are believers and those that are off the path. Uh, another important concept in relation to guidance is that of signs. The word ayat can mean verses or also signs. It's ambiguous in, in Arabic. And um, the idea is that Allah provides lots of signs and messengers draw attention to signs. So the role of a messenger is to draw our attention to the signs of God. The signs of God might be nature, the sun, the moon, the rain. It could also be how God has worked in history in the past to destroy civilizations or raise up others or rescue others. Um, and also the Quran itself is thought of as a sign as well, calling people to attend to the signs. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about messengers. What is a messenger? Um, Sorry, can I just ask, do yes. anything comparable to assurance? Do you know when you're successful? Do you know when you're on the right path? Well, there's two kinds of issues. Assurance. You, know you, right you can know path. you're on the right path just by following the message. So the assurance is you know, do what the messenger says. Grow your beard long and cover your wife and, you know, put your right shoe on before you left and everything that's required. So... Um, but in terms of assurance on Judgment Day, the Quran is ambivalent. There are some things that says that Allah will forgive those who choose the right path. But there's also passages that create doubt. So Muhammad says, the Messenger says, I don't know what will happen with me. Meaning, you should cultivate a healthy fear of, of judgment. So, I mean, the classic view is that when Muslims die, they don't have assurance of paradise or forgiveness. It's not sure. I think some, I think people's experience varies a bit on that one, but in principle there's no assurance, no guarantee of salvation. You just should stay on the right path and you depend on the mercy of God. Hmm. So Allah's solution to going to the problem of human beings going off the right path, being led astray, is to send messengers. And the task of a messenger is to call people to the path. So. Uh, he's sometimes called a caller. Surah 16, 125 says, Call, this is speaking to the messenger, call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good admonition and dispute with them by means of what is better. Um, Surah th 3, Yet how can you disbelieve when the signs of Allah are recited to you by the messenger and his messenger is among you? Whoever folds, holds fast to Allah has been guided to a straight path. Um, or Surah 7, praise be to Allah, he's guided us to this, that is, the people in the garden are saying, people have made it, are saying, praise be to Allah, he's guided us to this place. We would not have been guided if Allah hadn't guided us. Certainly the messengers of our Lord have brought us the truth. So it's the role of messengers to point out the signs of God and to bring people's attention to the, the straight path. So let's look at messengers. I sometimes call, I've invented a term, you've heard of Christology. Well, Islam has what I call Rasulology. Rasul is a messenger. And it has quite an elaborate theology of messengers. It's a big, big topic in the Quran. Um, it's of very central importance. Remember the, the Shahada, the Declaration of Faith, says Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. Interestingly, the Quran speaks of prophets, Nabi. But this term is only used in the Quran in the context of biblical figures and, 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 the, and Muhammad himself. 
So the basic concept is the concept of a messenger, but some messengers are called prophets and they're the ones that are sort of from the Bible. In fact, the Quran says that the, the people of Israel had the prophethood as a kind of gift from God, meaning it's a special title for messengers, basically. They're basically the same. But the, 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 the really the key, the key term is a messenger. Um, messengers are chosen and sent by Allah to humanity through history. Uh, all the named messengers in the Quran are human beings, men in fact, but there are a few references that, that, that angels could be messengers as well. Um, and some examples of messengers are Noah, Moses, Jesus, Lot. Some, are, many are biblical, some are not. Now, it's quite interesting that according to the Quran, the messengers are sent to a particular people. So God raises up someone from a people to be a messenger to that people. So to a city, for example. The Quran says, we haven't sent any messenger except in the language of his people so that he might make things clear to them. So what happens is that Allah chooses someone from a community, appoints them a messenger, and then they speak the language of the people and they can make it clear to them. So that's, this is the Quran's ideology of a messenger. And according to this view, the messenger of the Quran is the Arab messenger to the Arabs. So he's a messenger to the Arabs. Now the Quran says we have, Allah says we have raised in every community a messenger. Every town has had a messenger. So there must have been a lot of messengers. Now David Marshall, who wrote a book about messengers and the Quran, he gives a summary of what a messenger is. So I'll read it out. The messenger will typically criticize his people for not worshipping God alone and perhaps for certain moral failings as well. However, he's rejected by most of his contemporaries, although he does have some obedient followers. The messenger also warns his people that if they don't repent, they will suffer a great punishment from God. The story ends with a dramatic act of divine intervention. The unbelievers, are war as warned, are destroyed by God in a variety of ways. The completeness of the destruction of the unbelievers is often emphasized. The messenger and his followers are saved and vindicated. So messengers are preachers of judgment and calling people to the right path and then as part of the messenger story, of which there are many told in the Quran, judgment falls and um, the messenger is vindicated. Noah is an example. The story of Noah in the Quran is that Noah was sent to his people, the people of Noah, warning them about the judgment of God. They mocked him and said it was a lie. So God sent a flood to destroy the people of Noah, except for a small number who escaped and were vindicated and rescued by God. There's no reference in that story to the rainbow, to universal sin, to a covenant, to a promise. It's a messenger story, pure and simple. It's a sort of prototypical messenger story, and it describes the messenger's own self-understanding of what his job is. He's come to this Arab community to warn them about an imminent act of God that will destroy them, fire from heaven or something, and they should repent before it's too late. And, and then they will escape judgment and hopefully make it to the garden as well. Sometimes messengers are named and sometimes people are named. So Hud is sent to the people of Ob, which is an Arab community. And Noah was sent to the people of Noah. It's interesting, isn't it, that Noah is not... Like in the story of the Bible, the whole world is inundated, but in the Quran it's the people of Noah, his own people. Um, and interestingly, what happens is the Quran builds up this theology of what a messenger is, and then the messenger, the person who's the main human protagonist, is saying, that's who I am. And so he's telling all these stories about messengers in the past in order that people would understand who he is and what his role is. So a lot of the stories in the Quran about the past, Adam and Eve, Noah, they're all to vindicate, explain and justify the role of the messenger. The Quran says, I am not, or the, the, the messenger says, I am not the first of the messengers. He's one in a long line. <coughs> it's interesting, um, you know, he's called Muhammad four times. Muhammad means praised one, so it mightn't even be a personal name. It might just be a, a descriptor. And he's once called Ahmad, which also means most praised one. <coughs> and he's sent to his own people. So here's a, here's a verse from Surah 28. They are amazed, the people are amazed, that a warner has come to them from among them. 
You were sent as a mercy from your Lord, so that you might warn a people to whom no warner has come before you, so they might take heed. So what the Quran is saying here is that this community, the, the Quranic community, has never before had a warner, but now the warner has come to them. Let me say something that's really interesting is there's no clear, it's not clear in the Quran that the messenger is actually sent to the whole world. That's an idea that develops later after the Quran. It's not clear in the Quran. The main emphasis of the Quran is that the messenger is to his own people. There are some references to warfare against unbelievers in order to you know, bring them under the authority of the Islamic community. But I wouldn't say that the Quran, front and central, has this idea that Muhammad is the last of the prophets. That's something that's, that's developed after the text. It's very much, the Quran is mainly a text for a community saying, I am your messenger, you should listen to me. So there's, there's some inconsistencies between what the Quran emphasizes and what later Islamic theology has developed into a kind of global mission um, approach as well. And um, it's really interesting too that in, the, in these messenger stories, again and again, it's said that the messenger is only a warner. So the role of the messenger is just to tell people about judgment and warn them, but nothing else depends upon him. It says nothing is dependent upon the message but the, but the, the clear delivery of the message. So the, the, the warner gives the message and then it's up to God what he's going to do. He'll bring judgment in due time. Now, that didn't last. There's a big change in the Quran around that issue. The role of a warner gets developed, and I'll talk about that later. That's one of the, the big inconsistencies in the Quran. So you have a picture of a community where the messenger is saying there have been lots of messengers before me and I'm one of them and judgment is coming so you better, better repent and turn to God. It's an eschatological cult warning people about the judgment that is to come. Um, he does say that he's, he's taken over the role of a Nabi, the prophetic office. He says God's taken that from the Jews because of their sins and it's been given to me. So I'm an inheritor of that that title, of that particular messenger title, being entrusted to a people who don't disbelieve in it, that is the Arabs. Now, the functions and attributes of messengers, they're warners, they remind people to make them remember, because human beings are easily forgetting. They direct people's attentions to the signs. They call people to the path. They are rightly guided themselves. So the Quran's view is that messengers are really perfect people, really good people model people. This is a big difference from the Bible. Every major figure in the Bible, with perhaps the exception of Daniel or Jesus, you know, most of them have feet of clay. You know, Solomon built a temple of child sacrifice for one of his wives. David was an adulterer. Lot, you know, commits incest. Abraham prostitutes his wife twice. Um, on and on it goes, you know. And that aspect of the Bible is really quite shocking to Muslims. They find those stories very offensive. The, the Quranic idea is that a messenger is a rightly guided person. How can you guide other people if you're not rightly guided yourself? Um, and that's, a, that's one respect in which the Quran has not absorbed the ethos of the Bible. You know, that human beings are sinful by nature. That's a, another sign of that um, kind of difference with the Bible. Um, Messengers are always opposed and rejected. That's very clear. Islam expects people to reject the message. Those who disbelieve and call our signs a lie, they are a companion. They are companions of the fire. They are destined for hell. Now, there are also books. Some messengers have books. The Quran refers to itself as a book. Actually, the word in Arabic could mean writings. So it's not like our modern sense of a book, but it's something written. And Allah has sent down books previously. Every period has a book. It's the Quran says for every period of time there's a written decree, which could be a book. And the Jews have the book, that's the Taurat. And Christians have a book, the Injil, which comes from Evangel, from, from, from Greek, for Gospel. And um, so the Quran says, We gave Moses the book, complete, for the one who does good, and a distinct setting forth of everything, and a guidance and a mercy. So that's the Torah the Taurat. It's obligatory for Muslims to believe in these previous books. So Muslims have to believe in the Injil and the Taurat. They have to believe in the Bible. Muslims believe in the Bible. 
That is, they believe in the Bible that was originally given to Moses and to Jesus, which is now lost, and we have corrupted versions of it in our hands. So when they call us people of the book, they're people of, we are the people of the book that used to be, that we no longer have anymore. That's the, theoretically, that's the case. Nevertheless, many Muslims have a respect for the Bible because of that, and they might be really interested in doing a Bible study or a study of the Gospels with you, and they might have absorbed the idea that these are corrupted texts. Um, only three books are named in the Quran, the Taurat of Musa, the Injil of Isa, the Jesus, and the Zabur, the Psalms of David. Uh, and the Quran is named as being in line with these books. I want to introduce an, an important idea which um, I discovered and, and wrote about in my doctorate uh, that might help you understand how this all works. And it's what I call messenger uniformitarianism. Sorry about my writing. Uniformitarianism. Sorry about the long word. Um, this is a term from geology. There was a British geologist called Charles Lyell, and he developed the idea that the, the geological processes that have applied in the past are the same ones that are applying today. So if you want to know how rocks were formed, in the past, look at the processes today. Where did sandstone come from? Well, watch what's happening with sand. It was a volcanic rock, go and study a volcano. Okay, so it's an important scientific principle in geology. That, that is, that basically the processes in the world have, have been much the same. Now, messenger uniformitarianism is that Allah always deals with messengers in the same way. So he has the same basic game plan for every messenger. And this is a really big emphasis in the Quran. You might say that all messengers have the same biography over and over again, with lots of just small differences between them. And this, this principle serves as a validation of the messenger. So he says, everything that's happening in his life or in the life of the community, the messenger keeps saying, it's okay, this is exactly what's happened in the past with other messengers, because Allah always deals with messengers in the same way. Um, so your experience of opposition or whatever it is you're experiencing and following the messenger, that's okay because it's all happened before. There's nothing new about it. Um, an example, this is the satanic verses story, which someone rusty got into trouble for writing a book about, a speculative, somewhat obscene and blasphemous book. But um, the story is that at one point Muhammad got a verse which was praising the pagan gods. It says they're exalted. So this verse came to him and he recites it. And the, and the traditions say that the pagans began to be attracted to Islam when they heard that their gods were acceptable. But Muhammad's followers said, how could you say that, Muhammad? You know, this is completely contrary to everything you've taught us. And then Allah speaks to Muhammad and says, um, you were led astray by Satan. So Muhammad said, I've been led astray by Satan. And then the pagans say, well, who are you? You know, you're being led astray by Satan. And then Muhammad says, don't you know that every messenger has been led astray by Satan at some point? Mm. Messenger uniformitarianism pops up and validates his failing. Oh, it's just a sign that he's, um, you know, he was accused of just being a shepherd boy. He was an orphan. He was a very poor kid and he looked after the sheep in a pretty lowly position. And he said, don't you know that all the prophets have been shepherd boys? Look at David. You know, this is a sign that I'm a genuine messenger. People say, look, we've been thrown out of our homes. He said, well, that's happened to all the followers of messengers in the past. And then later, when he uses violence, he says, well, all the prophets have had to fight. This is part of, your, part of the way the messengers are. And this is a really strong and recurrent theme. You will find no change in the customary way of Allah, Muhammad says. But actually, there is a change. There's a big change, and that's one of the paradoxes of the Quran. And I'll talk about that change uh, when we get to it in a moment. Um, don't expect anything but the customary way of those of old, says the Quran. You'll find no change in the customary way of Allah. You'll find no change in the customary way of Allah, says it twice. In this way, the potential dishonor of being tempted or persecuted or whatever it is, is like a mark of authentication. Um, several passages comment on an accusation against the messenger 
and then follow it up with a, with, a res, with a claim that all the messengers have been accused of the same thing in the past. So no matter what accusation was made against the messenger, he would say, oh, that's what people said before about other messengers. Certainly messengers have been called liars before you, Allah says to him, yet they patiently endured being called liars and they suffered harm until our help came to them. Here's another verse. If they call you a night liar, know that messengers have been called liars before you who brought the clear signs. And another verse. When our clear signs are recited, they say, this is only a man who wants to keep you from what your fathers have served. You know, the, the prophet wants to turn them away from their old ways. And they say, this is just a forged lie. But you should need to know that those who went before them also called it a lie. They, in the past, they also called my messages lies. And I really loathe them said Allah. So this was the response basically to a lot of the criticism. Oh, this is what they always said about messengers. It's a very handy response because you can use it for any kind of objection whatsoever. Another way of validating the messenger was to use a report about a specific messenger. You tell a story that would somehow relate to the current issue. Um, for example, there'd be a long list of descri descriptions about how God destroyed earlier peoples who rejected messengers. And then the conclusion is, those who call our signs a lie, we shall lead them on step by step without them realizing it, that is to hell. Don't they re reflect their companion is not possessed, he's only a clear warner. So what's, what's happening is that the people were saying that messenger Muhammad is possessed and he's de demonized. And so the response that the messenger gives is to tell story after story of how God destroyed people in the past who mocked messengers. And then the punchline is, he's not possessed, he's just a warner. That's a very kind of typical argument in the Quran. And all the histories of messengers in the Quran, of which there are many, are fashioned as commentaries on the current experiences of the messenger. The messenger, the current messenger, is the hero of every messenger story. And references to previous scriptures also validate the Quran. So messenger uniformitarianism has many features. There are very similar parallel narratives from different stories. There's similar language. Uh, for example, the, the, the messenger, Muhammad, might be called a bringer of good news and a warner, but the same phrase will be used of Moses or of Jesus. They use the same language. They speak the ter same terms. So Isa says, Jesus says to his followers, this is a straight path. Which is exactly what Muhammad is saying all the time as well. And um, Moses says to his followers, surely I'm free of what you associate. You know, he's using the language of association, which is this theology of the monotheism in the Quran. It gets put into the mouth of Moses. So basically all these older prophets, they just speak like Muhammad. They have the same theological interests. They have the same experience. They use the same language. They're all Muslims in the model of Muhammad. They preach the same message. Muhammad, the Quran says, nothing is being said to you except what was already said to messengers before. Say, we believe in Allah and what's been sent down to us and what's been sent down to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them. You know, and that's why when Muslims say we honour Jesus, we honour Moses, we honour Abraham, you need to understand that that honouring is tied into a narrative which is designed to validate Muhammad. That's its whole function. In it. They add nothing new to the story. They just validate his experiences. And the response would be, we, valid, we validate Jesus and Moses and Abraham. Why don't you honour Muhammad? That's, that's the point of their stories, is to, is to validate Muhammad. We honour Jesus, why don't you honour Muhammad? Um, the Quran says that um, Jesus confirmed what was in the Torah and Muhammad has confirmed what was with Jesus. Uh, and so on and so on and so on. There are many other similarities. The believers of Muhammad have marks on their faces from bowing down. Like if you hit your head on the ground a lot bowing, you get a little bump, which is called in Arabic a zabiba, a raisin. And the Quran says that the marks on the faces of Muhammad's followers are the same on the followers of Moses and Jesus. They have the same kinds of opposition, the same accusations. Um, they've been called possessed magicians, bewitched forgers, just ordinary people. Um, they've all been led astray by Satan, etc., etc., etc. So this is the theology of, um, of messengers, Rasulology. Now, 
There's a problem with this story. According to this view, a messenger is only a warner. And all messengers have been exactly the same. They just warn people and then it's up to them what happens. But God will bring judgment. Now imagine you had your neighbour, someone you grew up with, who has a couple of followers and keeps telling you that if you don't do what he says, God's going to destroy you and your whole family. And he does that for about 10 years or 5 years or whatever. What are you going to say to him after a while? Sorry? Nothing's happened. Nothing's happened. You might say shut up, and, and the, the later the traditions say they tried to get rid of him. But you might also say, you might start mocking him, and how would you do that? You might say, bring it on. We're just waiting. And he didn't like being mocked. Muhammad, he, he used to kill the, the girls who sang funny songs about him first. They were the ones that he didn't forgive. And... And so this crisis happens, which I call an eschatological crisis. The crisis is the preacher of disaster has been preaching disaster and it hasn't happened, hasn't happened. I want to step back a bit from this. Um, there's a geographical issue here. Um, if, we, if we go back, this is the area where Muhammad is supposed to have been active, around here. And um, this whole area is riven by earthquakes. There's a, a fault zone that runs up here. There's um, the valley in which the Dead Sea is. It runs down to the Red Sea. That's a fault valley. It's below sea level. So this, this is an earthquake zone here. And there's earthquakes all around here. It's just one big earthquake zone. And the, the centre of uh, Arab trade and everything for more than a thousand years was Petra, which is about here somewhere. And that was destroyed by a series of very traumatic earthquakes. In fact, there were tsunamis, there was massive fires caused by these earthquakes. Thousands of people died. These people, in the few centuries before Muhammad, had experienced massive, destructive acts of God. We know that from the historians. In fact, Petra itself, which had been the centre of Arab trade, was itself destroyed, you know. And, um, however, in all this area, the Arabian plate is completely stable. There's no earthquakes taking place in Arabia. And if you're living in a tent in the Arab desert, you're the least likely person in the whole world to experience an act of God you can possibly imagine. And it doesn't actually make any sense to be preaching an apocalyptic destruction message to Arabs in the desert. But if you were preaching it over here in Petra, in this area, it would make a lot of sense. So that's a, it's an interesting, interesting issue. What is, the, what is the lived memory? Like if you went to Aceh and preached to people that a tsunami might come and kill 300,000 people if you don't follow God. It just happened 50 years ago or 30 years ago. People remember that. But if, you, if you're preaching to, I don't know, Australians about earthquakes, they sort of laugh at you. You know, we don't have them. Yeah. Yeah, hardly ever. There's tiny little earthquakes. And so that's an interesting question. What kind of community? There was a lot of apocalyptic uncertainty, um, you know, end, end times uncertainty at that time uh, amongst those communities. And what was then happening? Why was this a compelling message? So it's a really interesting geographical issue. I, I want to make a comment, too, about what I call this messengerology, the theory of messengers. I think because Muhammad looms so large in in the traditional Muslim way of reading the Quran, that there's not as much attention paid to those previous messengers or the systematic beliefs about messengers. Because once you say he's the last messenger, it's kind of irrelevant what happened with previous messengers. His story becomes the story, and, and the rest of it are just props. But it's really interesting to say, let's take a different view and actually look at what the Quran says about messengers, because it's quite a rich and interesting set of beliefs. Um, because the traditional view, Islamic view is that there's no more messengers after Muhammad. The, the Quran does not say that. The Quran, in fact, says that every society gets a messenger. Every city gets a messenger before Judgment Day. But that's sort of no longer applicable. Something fundamentally shifts. Now, in, in the Quran, the future, I'll talk about this eschatological crisis and how the Quran resolves it. You know, the problem of judgment not coming. What do you do when judgment doesn't come? and you're making your bread and butter out of preaching judgment. What do you do? Do you go away and tend sheep again? 
what point do you give up? Or how do you how do you deal with that? Now, the the Quran is very concerned with the punishment of God against evildoers. When the world comes to an end, everyone is going to be either in the fire or the garden. And there are lots of graphic descriptions of both. Here's a passage that describes what will happen at the end. When the pages are spread open, this is the heavenly book that's recorded everyone's deeds. And when the sky is stripped off, so the world itself is being pulled apart, and the furnace is set ablaze, and when the garden is brought near, then every person will know what he has presented. So your life will be presented openly before God and you'll be judged. There are these graphic descriptions of people being torn apart by the flames and, and you know, drinking fire and so on. Wives carrying firewood to burn their husbands in hell, you know. And those who heed the warnings will choose the straight path to the garden. Now, um, also the Quran says that those who mock messengers, when they get into hell, they'll know that what they were told was the truth. If only you could see when they are terrified and there's no escape. Uh, and, and they say in hell, we believe you now, Muhammad. We believe you now. But there's also um, another theme in the Quran, that is that there's judgment in hell, but there's also reference to judgment in this life. There's, there's the judgment that will fall now. And this, I said before at the start that the, the Quran is very conversational. There's a lot of debates going on all the time between the believers, disbelievers, Muhammad and others. And one of the debates is this crisis, eschatological crisis issue. And there's a lot of discussion about it. And the believers are frustrated. They're being shamed and mocked by their neighbours who are saying, when's it going to happen? And, uh, and some of the statements in the Quran are addressed to them. So the Quran says, don't be in a hurry with the unbelievers. We're only count God says, I'm only um, counting off a certain number of years until their time comes. On the day when we will gather to the merciful, the ones who guarded themselves like a delegation, and will drive the sinners into hell. So the time will come when you know the, the good will be justified and the wicked will be will be punished. So believers shouldn't be impatient. They should be patient and wait. Believers shouldn't be deceived by the apparent freedom of evildoers in the present. Allah is just sparing them for the day of punishment, which has a time that can't be avoided. For them, there's an appointment from which they'll find no escape. So the first response to the eschatological crisis is to urge the believers to be patient and wait, because judgment will come. And it's particularly what the Quran calls the nearer punishment that they're frustrated about not coming. Um, the believers are frustrated. Um, Allah speaks about two punishments, the nearer punishment and the further punishment. The nearer punishment is destruction in this life, and the further punishment is hell. How many a time, the Quran says, we have destroyed, a violent violence came upon it in the night, or while they were relaxing in the midday. How many a generation have we destroyed before them? So again and again, God has destroyed towns and generations who haven't followed him. Examples are given from the past, like Noah, or the people inundated in the flood. Um, Moses and the Egyptians is another example. Lot and Sodom. Um, Hud and Ad, which is an Arab group. Saleh and Tamud. Uh, Shaib and also Musa. There's several stories of these past destructions. The only case where people responded positively and repented and were spared was the story of Jonah, Yunus. Why was there no town which believed, says the Quran, and its belief benefited it, except the people of Jonah? The Quran also, this is really interesting, invites its followers to travel and to see the destruction that God has visited upon sinners apparent in the cities around them that have been destroyed and are lying desolate. There are many references to this. So apparently um, the Arabs that he was speaking to had around them ruins, evidence of ruins of past civilizations. The Quran also says that the generation of Lot are visible to them and says that um, the followers of the, the, the people listening to the messenger can walk past Lot's ruins in the afternoon. That's a really interesting idea because um, I'll go back. Oh no, it's the next one. See, Muhammad's in Mecca. Mecca's around here, but Lot is actually up here somewhere. So it's quite a long walk, afternoon's walk to get up there. So actually, one theory is that the, the, the text of the Quran was generated in Petra. Originally, and it's actually Petra Arabic. I think we're really sure about that. 
um, it doesn't fit this environment. There are ruins in North Arabia right here, um, but, but not around there. Anyway, this is an interesting point. So there's a lot of, you know, just walk and just look and you'll see how past generations have been destroyed. These are signs to you as well. The Quran says there's no town that we are not going to destroy before the day of resurrection or that we're not going to punish with a harsh punishment. It's written in the book. Every town will be destroyed at some point. There's many means of destruction, baked stones falling from heaven in the story of Lot and, and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, drowning in Noah's flood or the inundation of Pharaoh's army under Moses, earthquake and thunderbolt, uh, or wind is another example. And there are many references to what's called the double punishment. Allah will punish you in this life and the next. And also a double reward for the righteous. Those that are on the right path will be blessed in this life and they'll, go to the, they'll suffer in hell in the next. Now, there's this eschatological crisis, okay? And its resolution is, is, is a really striking thing. And, it's, and it's, it's aligned with a main change in the Quran. The traditional view of the Quran is that part of it was revealed in Mecca, and, I mean, in Mecca and then part of it in Medina. In Mecca, Muhammad was peaceful, he had a small band of followers, he had no power. And then in Medina, he gained an army and he began to fight and it became political. And so that the more violent verses are in Medina, the more peaceful ones are in Mecca, the whole community changes in its character. And so this changes in the Quran between a more a respectful or tolerant view, even though you're burning people in hell, at least in this life you're not trying to kill them, the change in the Quran between these more tolerant verses and violent verses is explained in terms of a biographical change in the life of Muhammad. But my research into the Quran suggests something different, that what happened was that as a result of this eschatological crisis where the unbelievers were saying, you know, it hasn't happened, bring it on, uh, and the believers who were following the messenger were getting anxious about this because their whole cult was based on the idea of the act of God. And the solution is that the prophet says, the judgment is, is coming upon you now and I am the judgment. And the sword of the believers is the act of God that I've been warning you about all this time. Let me give you some reasons why I, I, I give this explanation, okay? There's a shift from calling believers to be patient and leaving disbelievers alone to a kind of inaugurated eschatology of judgment upon rejectors here and now as an anticipation of hell. Um, so I call this the eschatological transition. And there's, um, there's lots and lots of references to rejection, rejection, rejection. But now the messenger imposes rejection on his enemies instead of waiting it for happen. This, the anxiety in the Quran among the disbelievers about this delay is very, very strong and clear. It must have been unsettling the movement altogether. They seek to hurry you with the punishment. They're saying, these believers are saying, bring it on, bring it on. But no, we'll just be patient. So there's lots of references to that tension that's building up. And, and then there's a, um, a, a, a violent act on the hands of the believers. So Marshall wrote, a once for all divine act of devastation is replaced by a gradual military and political campaign. Now associated with this campaign is a lot of shifts in the Quran. Because if you shift from saying, I'm only a messenger and my job is just to warn you, to saying, I am a commander and I have an army and you must obey me or else, lots of things change. What happens is that whole political organisation is instituted. Instead of emphasising just personal piety, there's an emphasis on, on being willing to fight and being willing to be engaged in this battle. And you can get these very clear distinctions between the pre-transition description of what Islam means and the post-transition. I'll just read a few examples. So pre-transition says, only those who believe in our signs, and who when they're reminded of them, fall down and glorify God, they are the ones who are not arrogant. These are the only ones who are believers who respond to the message. They leave their beds during the night to pray in fear and eagerness, and they give from what they've received. They give money. So that's pre-transition. Here's another pre-transition. Um, uh, people who believe uh, have the fear of the Lord. They believe in the signs of God. They don't associate anything with God, and they give generously. Um, and they're quick to do good deeds. So that's a, a pre-transition description. Post-transition, 
Who are the believers? The believers are allies together. They command right and they forbid wrong upon the heads of non-believers. They observe the prayer, they give alms, they obey Allah and the messenger. So that's interesting. You've got to shift towards obeying the messenger. Instead of the messenger being just a warner, and then it's up to them what they do, now you have to obey him personally. And what's more, they're allies of each other. The believers are, as it were, in cahoots against the world. And they're commanding right and forbidding wrong. They're telling everyone, everyone else, what's right and wrong. So it's not just leaving it to people, it's actually imposing righteousness. Here's another one after the transition. Who are the believers? They're the ones who, who repent, who serve, who praise, who bow, who prostrate themselves. The ones who command right and the ones who forbid wrong. And they keep the limits of Allah. So these are the ones who are the commanders of what's right and wrong in the world. Before the eschatological transition, the emphasis is on believing Allah's signs rejecting association of anything with Allah, making contributions to help the poor, praying daily, trusting in Allah, being eager to do good deeds. After the transition, the community is dissociated from non-believers. It cannot take them as allies. It is a more regulated community. It commands right and wrong. It exercises the authority of command over disbelievers. It obeys the messenger. So the messenger is no longer just a warner but is a, a, a leader with authority over them and it is in a, in a position of command. Um, it's interesting, the description of the fire and the garden changes as well. So pre-transition, surely those who disbelieve among the people of the book and the associators, they'll be in the fire of hell there to remain. They are the worst of creation. Surely those who believe and do righteous deeds, they're the best. Their payment is with the Lord, gardens of Eden beneath which rivers flow, there to remain forever. After the transition, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, he will cause him to enter gardens beneath which rivers flow, there to remain. That is the great triumph. Whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, which and transgresses his limits, he will cause him to enter the fire, there to remain. For him there's a humiliating punishment. It's quite a change in, in, in the description. The first test is sort of righteous and pious acts, but after the transition, it's obedience to the command of the messenger. Before the transition, the emphasis is on belief and doing righteous deeds, believing the message. After the transition, it's about obedience and not transgressing the limits set by the messenger. And the theme of judgment now upon disbelievers is correlated with lots of changes. There's increased reference to insecurity of believers and conflict causing believers to emigrate. There's references to fighting and taking over the property of non-believers, references to striving against unbelievers in fighting, Mes increased emphasis on distinctions between believers and disbelievers, um, references to the duty to command right and forbid wrong, uh, much fewer statements that the messenger is a warner, uh, increased emphasis on obedience, frequent use of the phrase Allah and the messenger as if they were just one, um, much less emphasis on divine judgment in this life. So there's much less talk about earthquakes coming or stones falling from heaven. Um, increased regulation of the community through detailed laws and prescriptions. And just relating to your question earlier, after this transition, the Quran elaborates the role of human beings as agents of divine punishment. So the Quran talks about believers as agents of wrath, which hadn't have been happening before. So Surah 7, your Lord proclaimed that he would raise up against them until the day of resurrection, those who inflict them with an evil punishment. So that says that Allah has declared that until the day of judgment comes, he will raise up believers to punish disbelievers in this life. Whereas before the messenger had been content to say, wait until the disaster hits us. Or from Surah 6, he is the one who's able to raise up punishment against you from above you or beneath your feet or confuse you into different parties and may some of you make some of you taste violence from others. See how we vary the signs so that we may understand. So instead of speaking about signs of, of rain and the sun and everything, it's saying one group killing another, that's a sign from Allah of the judgment that is to come. And it uses the language of tasting you taste and then you eat. The taste is what you experience now. When you go to hell, you'll, you'll eat the full deal later. 
Believers who'd formerly been told to be patient and restrain your hands from disbelievers are commanded to fight instead. Fighting is prescribed for you, it's obligatory, it's mandatory for you. And there's also lots of comments about people who won't fight, believers who won't fight, who stay at home. Some believers say in the Quran, O Lord, why have you prescribed fighting for us? And the answer comes back that all believers will die anyway, so wherever you are, death will overtake you. The implication being that it makes no difference whether you fight or not, you'll die in the end, so you may as well fight. The Quran explains that when believers kill others in divine judgment, it's not they who do the killing, but Allah himself. This relates to your question. You did not kill them. This was after a battle where the believers had fought their relatives and their family members over the religion of issues of religion. And the Quran says, you didn't kill them, but Allah killed them. And you didn't throw when you threw the spear, but Allah threw the spear. He was the one who killed them, not you. The language of tasting is used, which had been used in reference to hell as well. And it's used to refer to violence. So here's a passage from chapter 8. So make firm those who believe. I shall cast dread into the hearts of those who disbelieve. So cut them above their necks, cut off their heads, and strike off the cut off their fingers. That's because they broke with Allah and his messenger. And whoever breaks with Allah and the messenger, surely Allah is harsh in retribution. That is for you. So taste it and know that the punishment of the fire is for disbelievers. Now this particular verse is talking about people who were part of the community, who are called hypocrites in the Quran, who didn't want to keep going with the community and they step back from Islam. They don't want to fight. And so the believers fight them. And so he says, um, uh, you know, uh, that's because they broke with Allah and the Messenger. They were formerly following us, but they're not following us anymore. So we're cutting their heads off and we're cutting their fingers off. And that's a taste of the fire that is to come. So that's why I say this is the, full, this is the first punishment anticipating the second punishment. Well, I just ask you what you refer to the transition. Um, is the uh, Quran. Sorry, I just ask you what you refer to no, the transition. Um, no, they're all mixed. And um, um, Quran, the Quran is not in any kind of Quran. No, they're mixed. I want to know is the more consistent one. It is the consistent one. So. In the traditional understanding of Islamic theology, you know, Islamic jurisprudence and everything, and commentary on the Quran, this is the question of whether a verse, where in the biography of Muhammad's life that the chapter or the verse was revealed. And there's lots of commentary on that in Islamic tradition. So um, sometimes Qurans will say this is a Medina verse, which means it's a chapter which is later, or a Meccan one, which is earlier. So Inside um, Islam, they have made those attributions. In, inside Islam, they have aligned this in terms of the history of Muhammad's life. So they align the Quran in, in, in the verses and the chapters in chronological order um, in their minds, not in the te- in the written book, according to the biography of Muhammad. Okay. And is this um, supported by Western critical scholarship or not? Really? Great question. Um, there are problems with that is with their accounts the because they're trying to come against the life of Muhammad. There are very significant changes in the text of the Quran that align with that. So you've got changes in vocabulary, in theology, and um, and so that's what I'm saying. There's a big theological shift. When you read the Quran, you can tell that some are in one place and some are in another. And and basically what I think what Islamic history does, Islamic religion does, is it is it it, 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 it adapts that to the life story. In fact, you could say that the life story of Muhammad is an explanation for the Quran. So that the life story of Muhammad was developed in order to make sense of these inconsistencies in the Quran. And, and what, what the, um, the Western scholars did beginning in the 19th century into the 20th century is they reviewed all that evidence and they did what you might call a literary historical analysis of the Quran. And so German scholars... Uh, particularly did a lot of detailed work on this and they proposed particular sequences. In fact, people have divided the Meccan Quran into like three or four different phases and then there's the Medina Quran. And sometimes you get verses in a chapter that are out of place. So most of the chapter is early, but then a bit of the chapter is late. So you do, the, the, the chapters are made up of bits and pieces that have been put together. So there's some inconsistencies there. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of work that's gone into that. And you can even buy a Quran that's supposedly in an order that someone has suggested is the order in which it was written. And um, that's quite an extensive literature about that. 
Islam itself as a religion cannot function without this tying of the text to the life of Muhammad. The whole religion is based on it. My suggestion is actually, don't think of it as a biographical shift. Think of it as a theological issue. And what is the theological change that's happening? Instead of trying to squeeze the text into a biography, ask what is the ideology and what is the change? And that's why I'm, I'm suggesting a different explanation. Instead of saying, oh, Muhammad suddenly got allies and he was powerful, there's actually a lot of evidence in the text for this increasing frustration with this apocalyptic message that doesn't get fulfilled. And then the solution becomes, I am the judgment of God for you. What's really interesting, too, is that a group like the Islamic State, which has quite an apoc apocalyptic tendency, it's brought into this full on. And it'll often say, we are you know, bringing hell upon disbelievers, let them taste it. That's, that's where they're heading. You know? So they've been really deeply impacted by this way of looking, looking at, at the Quran, this reading of the Quran. In the traditional view, there are certain incidents that are clearly in Mecca or Medina. And so if, if, the, if the Quran references those incidences, you can know that you can locate that. Um, very little of the Quran was revealed at the time he was attacking Mecca. That was later. So it's early Mecca or late Medina. That's the contrast. Um, and look, the reality is that although some verses in the Quran can be tied into specific events in the life of Muhammad, a lot of them can't very easily. And there are inconsistencies in the Hadiths between when which verse was revealed and in what context. There are competing texts. So this is a very messy area. It's a problem and it's difficult. You've got some chapters like two, chapter two, that have materials that seem Meccan and Medinan. So it's, it's, it's not a simple area, actually. Um, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is a completely different approach that doesn't try and treat it as a literary historical point of view or a biographical point of view, but says, what's the theology of the Quran? And what I gave you before, the summary, is the, is the summary of the theology that applies all through the Quran. But what happens after the transition is that there's a layer put on it where the, the Islamic community is the hand of God to bring judgment on the world and the, and the messenger as well. And that's sort of a, that's an extra that's added on. The basic theology still applies, but there's something extra that's added. The Quran teaches violence and judgment. Or is, or, or the liberal guys abandoning the original... What a good question. What a good question. Um, this is an issue that's really important. Uh, it's possible to be a moderate Muslim. And, and someone have suggested that the principle of abrogation should be reversed, so that the earlier verses should be, have more authority than the later verses. The later verses were context-specific. Uh, those circumstances have passed. The earlier verses are more general. We should apply those. Um, some people have been hanged for suggesting things like that. Uh, and sometimes Western people who think of the Reformation as a kind of dilution of Christianity instead of a return to biblical principles think that Islam could go through such a reformation as well. But the problem is groups like Al-Qaeda are the fruit of the reformation that, are, that is a reviving the text. My feeling is that the texts themselves of the Quran and the Hadith, they have a, a compelling integrity to them that mean that those that argue for the more violent interpretations, I think, have more intellectual credibility. That is, the, the, those interpretations are very compelling. Um, I sometimes compare it to playing cards. You know, when you play cards, you have twos and threes and fours, and then you have jacks and kings, queens and aces. The radicals have all the aces and the kings and the queens, and then the moderates, they say, I've got a seven, I've got this verse, you know. But the problem is that there's already an account for that verse in Islamic tradition that subjugates it under the violent verses. And so you, that's just my opinion, you know, having stirred through these materials and read it as a theologian and as someone who you know looks for order and systematizes things the mind of a person who writes a grammar out of a out of the speech of a community and looks for order and system i think the radical interpretations are, will be the more enduring another way of putting it is a moderate interpretation is not sustainable its authority is weak and i think most mo islamic moderates what they do is they take ideology from contemporary culture from modern culture and they appeal to human conscience. You know, it's against human conscience to kill other people or something like that. But as one of my friends who became a Salafi radical Muslim and then later left that and became a Christian, he said, when I was a Salafi, he said, we used to put a lot of energy into getting people to do things against their conscience. And Islam as a religion traditionally is not based on conscience. It's based on divine dictate. 
And it's, it's really, the Quran is a pretty shocking book. I mean, when I read the Hadiths for the first time and read the Sahih Muslim and the Sahih al-Bukhari, it's like 12 volumes, I was very depressed for a while because I thought, I wasn't clinically depressed, but my, I was sad because um, it's very hard to turn this in a different direction. Like the material is just so disturbing. And I suppose what I'm doing now is, is, is to give you a, a window of what it actually means to make this stuff consistent and to present it in a consistent way. This is, this is the end station that you end up on. Um, uh, it's hard because, you, you, you know, what do you do politically? If you've got moderate Muslims saying, no, that's not true Islam, true Islam is this and this and this. And if you argue against them, you sound like you're doing Al-Qaeda's work for them. And uh, it's problematic. And I'd say to people, good on you, you know, you should promote peace. I think that's fantastic. I really encourage you to do it. I don't find that compelling as an interpretation. And what, what is very, very problematic is when the moderates say that the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda or the Salafists are not true Muslims. That is, there's nothing in Islam to support their saying. This can't be based on Islam. It's a travesty to Islam. It's abuse of Islam. Th these are, I think, actually unsustainable arguments. The, 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 you know, the Islamic State's view is, a, is, a, is an intellectually credible interpretation. It's a morally incredible one, but it's, it's, it's based... If you just accept the principle that Muhammad is the messenger, the hadiths are authoritative. This the, the example is authoritative. And the Quran is the word of God. They're, the argument to support a lot of their positions is clear. And what's more, um, the supreme uh, institutions of Islamic law, like Al-Azhar University in, in Cairo, they teach these dogmas that the Islamic State teaches. They have very similar theologies. The mainstream, you know, the grand muftis of many nations teach lots of positions that the Islamic State teaches. They differ on a few key points, like they, they, they differ with the Islamic State's rejection of all authority and that they can make an authority unto themselves. Most conservative Muslims say, if you've got a Muslim as a king, you have to obey him. But the Islamic State, no, we can, they say, we'll declare anyone we want to to be an infidel. But, but everything else, you know, martyrdom, slavery, belief in slavery, making Christians pay jizya under his, you know, the, 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 all, a lot of the leaders of Islamic universities and and senior scholars, they support all these things, at least in principle. Um, and, and it's that, that we have, we're frightened by that prospect. It's kind of scary. What do you do with all that? And what's really interesting is in the West, we, we are terrified by this. So where we cope with it is that's not true. This isn't real Islam. Islam is peaceful. Islam is peace. So after 9-11, um, George Bush says, Islam is peace, you know? But, but actually, the Muslims who live in the Middle East, who are living under these systems, and they don't like it, their, their response is to leave Islam. So more people are leaving Islam now than at any time in history. And because they're being told by the Islamic State or by the Muslim brother, well, this is true Islam, what we're doing to you. And they say, OK, I'm out of here. I don't want this anymore. I accept what you're saying, but I don't, I don't want to be a Muslim in that case. Um, it's very, it's, it's quite, this, I said love and truth in my early devotion need to be combined. So you need to love Muslims with all your heart, but you need to be able to tell the truth about what's, 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 what's painful about being a Muslim is that all this stuff is painful and it's very hard for them. In order to locate a verse or a path, it's called a passage, so it's not depend on a particular number. You've got a passage and where does that fit in the life of Muhammad? You have to have evidence in the hadiths, in the traditions of Muhammad, that refer to that text in some way. And some do, but there's lots of verses, that, lots of passages that don't have any links. And sometimes you get traditions that are contradictory, so they'll refer to a text in, in different phases of Muhammad's life. And the problem is there isn't a consistent, and it, it, the, the, the tying the text down to the life of Muhammad is quite a messy, messy area. It's, it's, it has all the evidence of being something that was done much later, and imposed upon a text. And, and so there's that, although Islam is based on that idea, and the whole structure of Islamic law is based on that principle, it's, it's nevertheless a kind of, this is one of the problems with Islam actually, is the intellectual problems is there's a gap between those two. How Islam should be We as Christians should be disciples of Christ. With that view, if you want to In our view, disciples of Jesus. 
we as Christians should be disciples of, of Christ. Yes, yeah, so it well, follow Jesus, 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 Jesus to, to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus, to do it. Can be no peace for Islam. Yeah, peace could apply if everyone converted to Islam, yeah. Or surrendered and lived under Islamic law. So, yeah, Islam is peace after the victory. Muhammad took sex slaves, he beheaded people. When he um, was upset with the Jews in Medina, he expelled them. The last tribe, he, he beheaded all the men, six to eight hundred, in the marketplace of Medina. And one of the leading women, he took as one of his concubines. Then when he attacked the Jews in um, uh, uh, Kaibar, he, um, he took one of the leading women there as his wife. One of his followers marched around their, their marriage tent through the night and he asked in the morning, why did you... Why did you march around our tent all night? And his followers said, well, you killed her husband and her brother. So I was worried that she might cause you some harm. And Muhammad said, well done. Thank you. That's very kind of you to do that. And um, he sold people as slaves. He said, Allah smiles or laughs when he sees people entering paradise in chains. This idea that Islam is a religion of peace when the prophet is beheading people and taking sex slaves, it's in the Quran. How do they reconcile that and say, well, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, that's not the real... This is, it's, let, me get, let me say it's a complex answer. Firstly, um, um, it's about slavery. Slavery was only formally abolished in Saudi Arabia um, in, the, in the 60s, and it still exists in practice. Slavery would exist all across the Muslim world if, if European powers hadn't stopped it. With their gunboats, the British shut down Zanzibar as a, as a slave trading centre, for example. Um, the, what happens psychologically is this. There's lots of confronting stuff there. You don't want to go there. So you suppress it. You just say, Islam is peace, Islam is peace. It's like all these women who find you know, handsome Muslim men and marry them, and they buy into what they're told. How can you get out? You know, how do you get out of that? You can't. In fact, Islam says that you should be killed if you leave Islam. Is that a religion of peace? There's not a single Islamic leading scholar that doesn't acknowledge that Islam teaches, at least traditionally, that you should kill someone who leaves Islam. Um, so how do you get out? So the way you do is you, you, you rationalise it. Oh, no, that doesn't really mean that. There's a misunderstanding. The Prophet was the most beautiful person who ever lived. He was very kind. And you come up with all these incredible post hoc explanations about why it was permissible for Muhammad to marry a, a five-year-old girl and consummate it when she was nine. In Iran today, there's no minimum age marriage for girls because of Muhammad's marriage to Aisha when she was nine years, or consummated when she was nine years old. Um, you know, Muhammad promoted female circumcision. He said, just don't cut too deep. Uh, there's so much that's just quite shocking. And it's what you do if, you, you know, so you have to make up a story. You have to live with yourself. And it's fascinating to study the psychology of people's state. But the reality is that if you had a really serious intellectual debate between a radical Muslim who knew the source as well and one of those moderates, the moderate would just be cut to pieces. They would not be defensible. And that's why some of the young people get radicalised. They're radicalised because, well, there's lots of reasons. They want to fight. They think it's great and glorious. They hate the West, whatever it is. But the fundamental is, 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 is the arguments are very compelling. There is no ambiguity. Let me give you another example. There's tradition. These are traditions that are that are had, that are sahih. They're in that they're regarded as the most highest category of reliability about Muhammad's life. Muhammad's soldiers were off fighting, and they were practicing coitus interruptus with the women that they'd taken as slaves, because they didn't want to impregnate them. And Muhammad said, "You don't need to do that. It's up to Allah whether a child is born or not." You know, it's absolutely shocking. It, when you read, when you read the, 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 the stories, it, uh, we, and when I read these stories from cover to cover, it's actually unbelievable, unbelievable. Muhammad would be thrown into jail many times over if he did all the things he did in South Africa today. He would be regarded as a criminal. And, but in Islam, he's the best man who ever lived. So you, actually, Islam is in this huge crisis. What do you do? You either destroy your conscience and you join the crew, you join the Islamic State, and you believe in all this stuff, or you live in a state of denial. And then you've got other people. You've got some people who are actually, they believe the stuff. They believe that Muhammad, you know, killed the Jews and it was good, but they present a different face because they're actually trying to lead people into Islam. 
So you've got the people who are deceptive. They present the pleasant place. Let me give you an example of that. Um, there were a whole group of Muslim leaders who wrote to the Pope, the German Pope, after he gave a speech saying that Islam, you know, promoted violence and, um, and was not rational. And so a whole group of Muslim scholars wrote to him and they denied that. They denied that Islam ever promoted violence. And several amongst those signatories who are really leading Muslim scholars, like the chief justices of courts in nations or grand muftis of nations, they had earlier written words very clearly promoting aggressive um, conquest jihad over non-Muslim states in order to advance Islam. And they wrote to the Pope to say that he was not speaking the truth when he said that. And, you know, I have read so many statements like that as inconsistencies, and I, I've written about it in my blogs. It's just actually shocking. Now, they have a complicated way of justifying the way they do that. Um, but, but you get some people who are actually just deliberately uh, presenting a, a, a good face to Islam, but when, the, when Sharia law applies, it'll be a different story. That's a, it's a, that's a complicated story. Now, not everyone is like that. I don't want you to think that every Muslim thinks like that. You know, the, the, the wife of one of Australia's most prominent Muslims, who's a journalist on TV, she's a convert from Uniting Church to Islam. She's always saying how beautiful Islam is. But when, when she's off in Malaysia, she might say there are some problems, but she doesn't say that to the Australian community. And she's caught in this place. What do you do with all this stuff? I think Christians have some problems as well, like, you know, what do you do with Joshua or the genocide of the Canaanites? I mean, Christians have our own issues, but, but the issues that are in the, in the Quran and Islam are much, much worse because when Muslims behead people in the name of jihad, they're actually doing what, what Muhammad did. But if Christians go and kill and rape in the name of Jesus, they're not doing what Jesus taught them to do. This is completely different. When, when the Iranian revolution happened, uh, Iran had been secularized under the, the, uh, the Shah. And, you know, people wearing miniskirts and women wearing miniskirts. And society was changing, becoming modern. And Ayatollah Khomeini and his group said, look, when you get Islam, you'll have democracy, you'll have freedom. The Iranians believed it. They didn't know. They thought Islam was beautiful. They thought Muhammad was the best person who ever lived. But when Sharia law was imposed, they groaned in pain because their daughters are being raped and people are being hanged and terrible things are happening in the name of Islam. They had no idea of what, what it would look. And this has happened again and again in Algeria, in Egypt, now in the Islamic State. There's been case after case where revivalist Islamic groups have finally won power, imposed strict Islamic law, and it's just caused enormous trauma. And then people say, I mean, in, in Egypt, they got rid of the people, got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood within a year because they were so shocked by this group that had been saying for years that Islam was the solution. There's never been an example in the, in the last hundred years of a society moving towards a strict Islamic kind of system that's actually produced something like freedom or peace. It's always caused pain. And, and actually, wherever that has happened, there have been thousands of people that have turned to Christ and left Islam. The other thing I could say, too, as a general comment, is that Islamic societies struggle. They struggle economically. Their education systems struggle. Their human development indices are low. They, 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 they're, they're, they're failing societies in many ways. And um, it's, it's tough. You know, if someone said, I'm a Muslim, you might say, I'm sorry to hear that, because most Muslims live in societies. The, 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 the GDP of the Middle East, apart from oil and excluding Israel, is less than that of Finland's. And it's, it's, these are societies who are right on the doorstep of Europe that have had huge opportunities to, 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 make, to develop industries. And, and Islam is, 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 is a, it has a negative impact on, on society sometimes. Anyway, there's a, there's a lot to talk about. But yeah, it's, it's actually, Islam has a lot of cognitive dissonance built into it. Like, it's, I think it's tough being a Muslim because you're meant to believe Muhammad is the best example that ever lived, but, but you're not actually supposed to read the materials of his life. Someone else reads that for you and tells you what to believe about him. But today, with the internet, all this stuff's translated and lots of Muslims are reading it and they either radicalise or they reject Islam. But it's very hard to be just a God-fearing person who just accepts a simple faith and gets on with your life. That's, that's become a very hard place to be.